we have a fireside chat with Dr. Seth Herman Panchanathan, uh, who's the director of the National Science Foundation, and Judy Woodruff, an emeritus member of Research America's board, an anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. And they'll talk about an exciting bill that just became law, the Chips and Science Act. A quick reminder that all of our speakers' bios can be found in the toolbar at the bottom of the auditorium page. So Judy, with thanks, I, I am delighted to turn the program over to you. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be with all of you. And I applaud once again, the work that Research America does year in and year out under Mary's leadership and uh, just this extraordinary team of um, staff and board. Um, I, it's, it, you know, the, the work you do has never been more important, I think it's fair to say, than it is today. So I'm honored to be part of this program and honored to have this chance to speak with Dr. Panchanathan. Um, I understand you go by Punch, but I'm not going to call you that, uh, even though we're on a, on a, a closed loop here, so to speak. Um, but it's a welcome, uh, Dr. Panchanathan, and we are to talk about, this is, by the way, the modern version of the fireside chat. We can't, <laughs> we can't have a real one, and especially on a day when it's in the 90s, I guess, in Washington, D.C. Um, but we are here to talk about this legislation that President Biden signed into law at the end of July, all about uh, promoting um, semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. It's been described by some as the most significant piece of uh, science legislation in this country uh, in, uh, in a generation. Do you agree with that, first of all? And what impact do you think it's gonna have? Judy, thank you so much for having me here. And thanks to Mary and Research America for inviting me. I think this is a fantastic topic, first of all. And Judy, I've been a fan of yours, so I should start with that watching you in PBS News Hour. So it's indeed a, 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 an honor to be with you today. So uh, this is a very, very important moment for science, technology, engineering, and particularly solving problems for humanity, society, national security, and economy. So clearly this piece of legislation, I would agree that it is a landmark piece of legislation that is going to, I think when people look back, Judy, several years from now, they will say, this was a pivotal moment which essentially resulted in the acceleration of progress. And I can talk more about this based on your uh, you know, follow-on questions, but I want to say that I cannot overstate this. This is going to unleash unbelievable ideas and talent all across our nation in all aspects of science, engineering, and more. So, so you are the head of the National Science Foundation. So Help us understand how the NSF is going to have what your role is going to be in working with the federal government as uh, as it plays a larger role, frankly, in uh, in pushing uh, microprocessing. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about NSF. This is 72 years since the NSF was founded in 1950, Judy. And that was, a, again, a very, very important moment. We were coming out of World War II and a fantastic scientist and visionary, Vannevar Bush, wrote this amazing treatment called Science the Endless Frontier, what science can do for advancing prosperity, health, and national security. And today, 72 years later, there are many, many things that speak for what NSF has been able to unleash, right? So what NSF will do as, it, as we, we are moving into the future, clearly we see there are a couple of things that still needs a lot of work. First of all, there is tremendous amount of ideas and talent all across our nation, which have not been fully energized. And I would say that that transcends the geographies, the amazing geography of our nation, rural, urban, as well as all 50 states. It transcends the unbelievable socioeconomic demographic that we have and how do we unleash talent and ideas across a broad socioeconomic demographic and the rich diversity of our nation. So this moment is calling on us to say, we have not done enough to take advantage of all the ideas and talent in this moment where global competition is fiercest possibly that we have ever seen, which to me is a good thing because it is motivating us, inspiring us to do more, better, faster, so that we might be in the vanguard of competitiveness. So what NSF will do is therefore unleash all of those ideas and talent across all these the spectrum of science and engineering to start with, but even more importantly, how do we translate the fundamental research ideas that we're going to scale to also translate in partnership with industry 
and entrepreneurial ecosystems so that they might see those outcomes, either solutions to a climate change problem or solutions to the kinds of things that we need, technologies like AI, quantum, advanced wireless, biotechnology, and a host of others. So let's just get one of the skeptical questions out of the way at the outset. And that is the argument, yes, um, uh, it's important to do these things, but this is a capitalist economic system in this country. Why does the government need to get involved in putting a lot of money into this? Why not leave it to the private sector? Let a thousand flowers bloom or whatever uh, the, the appropriate uh, 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 analysis uh, would be. Yuri, that's a fair question, but let me address it the following way. I like to give examples, but before I get to the examples, the role of the federal government is to see how we can invest in high risk, high reward ideas. Yes, industry can invest and does invest in you know, ideas and see how they can develop into products and services and so on. But the high risk, high reward ideas are squarely in the domain of the federal government because that then creates this unbelievable, you talked about this unbelievable flowers in this wonderful garden, right? That, that, that we all see every day coming from our fantastic industry and entrepreneurs. But let's take an example. I'm gonna give you the story of a company called Ginkgo Bioworks out of Boston. Today, it is about a 10 to $15 billion company. Let's talk about the journey of Ginkgo Bioworks. That will give you a sense of why federal government needs to invest early in the game. There were two graduate students, Jason Kelly and Rashma Shetty, in early 2000s that had the Graduate Research Fellowship investment from NSF. They worked with two faculty members, Tom Knight and Drew Endy at MIT. And they were also funded, the faculty members, by NSF in their early ideas of synthetic biology. At that time, synthetic biology was very, very early in its sort of, you know, in terms of its design, in terms of its development. Okay? In mid 2000s, NSF invested in a research center called Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center at MIT. Tom Knight and Drew Wendy were the PIs of that, of that center. And again, both these students, uh, Jason Kelly and Rashma Shetty were uh, students in that center. Now, late 2000s, they decided to co-found a company called Ginkgo Bioworks along with their mentor, Tom Knight. Now, at that time, NSF invested again in their early ideas in the formation of the company through the program called the Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR program, in phase one, which is nurturing the idea first to the first level, then phase 2A and phase 2B to further advance the ideas to a larger scale. Came with it other SBIR investments from other agencies. Soon after, they secured $60 million of venture capital investment. Today, it is a 10 to $15 billion company, really at the cutting edge of biotechnology how to use DNA and cells to you know, ensure that we are providing solutions for a variety of applications, whether it's agriculture, health, whatever that might be. Now, this is truly exemplifies what early investments can do, Judy, is there are thousands and thousands of such stories. And that's, what, that's why the federal government needs to get involved because such ideas will never see the light at the end of the day, will never become those flowers that you talk about to bloom if we didn't have the soil prepared, if we didn't have the seeds put there so that those plants then can grow and the flowers can bloom. So it requires all of the above. So let's talk just a little bit more about the role of the National Science Foundation, the NSF, in making this happen. I've, I've, I've read, I'm reading that you are taking some new approaches to how you do this. Can you, can you spell some of that out in a nutshell? Absolutely. First of all, the first thing that I'm trying to say is that NSF has done a fantastic job in the last 72 years, but this is a moment to strengthen at speed and scale. So I call it the established NSF. Let's make sure the established NSF is able to unleash the great ideas and talent across the nation. Number one, NSF is the agency that is majorly responsible for STEM talent across our nation and unleashing new ideas across all, uh, all fields of science and engineering. Second, um, as I said to you earlier, talent and ideas are democratized and are in every part of our nation. So we cannot leave any talent behind. That would be a disservice to our nation, to our citizens, and more importantly, will not get us in the vanguard of competitiveness. And I will come back to that in a moment, Judy. The third piece is when I came in, I said, we need to launch a new directorate of technology innovation and partnerships called the TIP directorate. You might think of it as tipping the balance in our favor. 
So this is a cross-cutting directorate, Judy, which is essentially how do you take the amazing innovations coming out of our computer science and engineering directorate, our mathematical physical sciences directorate, right? Our bio directorate, geo directorate, right? And engineering directorate, education and, and learning directorate, as well as most importantly, the social behavioral economic sciences directorate. All of those ideas being rapidly pulled out and seeing how in partnership with industry, and the economic development ecosystems and entrepreneurs that we can draw, draw them out and create these unbelievable ginkgo bioworks like companies at speed and scale. So that is a new development. This is the first new directorate, Judy, at NSF in 31 years. Wow. So that's one thing. Coming back to the thing that I said, I will promise to talk to you about talent. If you want to then take this talent that is coming out of minority serving institutions, historically black colleges, universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, you know, uh, technical institutions and community colleges and rural areas, urban areas. How do you get these talent to play? And so what we are doing right now at NSF is launching a program. We have never, several programs that specifically ensure that talent is built in the K-12 community colleges and the four-year research, four year research universities, four-year colleges and research universities. But we are sort of building a new program, Judy, on top of that called GRANTED. GRANTED is an acronym. Growing Research Access for Nationally Transformative Equity and Diversity. What is this program going to do? Universities, like the university that I came from, and many what I call Research One universities, have fantastic research offices that help faculty with their ideas to then you know, present it in the form that then prevails in the gold standard merit review of NSF. It's very, very hard, as you know, to get a proposal funded NSF. I speak from personal experience, okay? but. So institutions which don't have that kind of infrastructure to help faculty, then do not ever get a chance to get their ideas in front and be successful. So this granted program is going to be a research office, a virtual research office that is available for anyone, any institution, any faculty to be able to present their ideas and package their ideas in a way that transcends the gold standard merit review and be successful. And that's where the diversity of students are coming in and we want them to be excited and be then nurtured in terms of their talent and make available those talent for becoming the future entrepreneurs and industry leaders and skill develop a skill technical workforce that makes our country you know, competitive. So I hope I have given you a, a sort of a yes. snippet of how we are thinking about this. Yes, and we like the acronyms. We like granted and we like TIP. <laughs> um, so I just I just want to put a button on that point. I mean, it, you're, you, are, you are stressing the, the importance of diversity which has simply not been stressed enough when it comes to the sciences. That's very, very true. Let's talk about true innovation, Judy. We are talking about innovation here, right? True innovation comes about when there is diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, diversity of experiences, diversity of context. Yes, diversity of every type that we can think about, which contributes to all of the forms of diversity that we're talking about. It's a missed opportunity. In fact, I, in fact, I even go a little bit stronger than this, Judy. I say that who better can be an entrepreneur than a person who has gone through unbelievable experiences in their early childhood, working two jobs, supporting their family. These are people who are taking ultimate risks and that's such wonderful talent with this mindset of risk-taking and entrepreneurialness should be, should be cultivated. And we are missing out on that. We cannot let that happen anymore in our nation. Dr. Panchanathan, there's a panel a little bit later uh, in this program titled Trust in Science. Yeah. How do you break down, and we know there is uh, just a lack of understanding, misunderstanding between this, so much of the science community and so much of the, the rest of the world, the non-science community. How do you break down some of that mistrust? We've certainly seen it during the pandemic. We've seen it in other ways. How do you begin to break that down? Judy, you know this very well as a, you know, as, as a fantastic newscaster, right? A journalist. Trust is not given, trust is earned. Let's be very clear about that. So we have a responsibility. That's why I challenge myself, NSF, and the scientists at large. We have to earn the trust. And earning the trust requires a lot of work to be done. First, being able to communicate what science is and what science has done and what science is capable of doing for humanity and society. That's the first thing that we need to work really hard on. So I challenge ourselves and the entire scientific community to do better at it, to better at it, to be able to articulate the value proposition so that people can get excited. And the second thing, science 
is not just, you know, this is it and that's, you know, it's done and either take it or leave it. Science is not that. In fact, science is a process of uncovering the truth constantly. You know, you take, you, you, you have an hypothesis, you test it, you build it through experimentation, you come up with some understanding, but that understanding may not be complete sometimes, it's partial. So you then do some more steps. So science is a process of evolution sometimes. So people need to understand that too, because science is not you know, always the universal truth right at the beginning. It's a process of obtaining and, and achieving the truth. So people need to understand that too, so that they can have an appreciation of that. The third jury, which I'm very, very excited by at NSF as a unique agency, because we have the social behavioral economic sciences as one of the major areas that we you know, foster at NSF. I tell my technology engineering colleagues, you have to make sure that social behavioral economic sciences is not an afterthought. It is actually the process of designing the technology itself. Humanists, artists, social behavioral scientists have to be engaged right in the beginning as we shape the technology, as we build the technology, as we design the technology. And I think I find that that approach, Judy, is going to build more trust also. Because when you involve the community, then the community that benefits from this outcome of science and technology, then you build more trust. So we need all of this and more, Judy, to get to that point of achieving and garnering and earning that trust, which I think NSF is going to be working really hard because I strongly believe in that. You're, you're so right about having to earn uh, the trust, earn the credibility. Last question, this was suggested to me, uh, Dr. Panjanathan, and I just have a couple of minutes left, um, but, this is, but it is essentially, how do we not only maintain our global competitiveness when it comes to science and innovation research, but how do we maintain the excellence that the United States has known uh, for, for so long and at a time when there's so much uh, competition around the world. There's brain power uh, everywhere on the planet. How does the U.S. maintain that excellence? I think, you know, we all would agree that, as you, as you rightly pointed out, U.S. United States has been looked upon as the beacon, as the beacon of how people look at you know, how, how might innovation be fostered? How might fundamental science and technology engineering ideas be unleashed? How might companies, you know, that people, you know, look up to, you know, get created in this amazing nation of ours? But in order for us to be in the vanguard of competitiveness, as I said earlier, we need to bring every bit of talent and idea as we move forward, okay? So which means that I said, we need to double down, triple down, quadruple down on the domestic talent being unleashed at full force and full scale. Now, you augment that, you don't substitute it with, you augment that with welcoming global talent like no tomorrow. Welcome all the global talent that you can bring to this great nation of ours to see how you can you know, bring all the full power of the global talent, full force of the global talent, augment it with the domestic talent so that the, the talent can work together. And then you do more than that, the sauce, the secret sauce of partnership. How do we hyper partner? How do we partner? You know, I'm a huge fan of partnering across agencies because all the agencies do amazing work, whether it is NIH, Department of Energy, NIST, NOAA, NASA, you name it. Department of Defense, DARPA. So I'm a huge fan of making sure that we partner, partner, partner between agencies, hyper partner with industry. Because I am, you know, I've been proposing this regional innovation engine idea all across the nation. And these innovation clusters are like the Bell Labs everywhere, everywhere. So these are public private partnerships through which to create that. So that's a second level of partnership. Third, partnership with other entities, cities, states, K to 12, community colleges, universities, foundations. And last but not the least, make sure that we partner, hyper-partner with nations and countries which share our fundamental values. Fundamental scientific values of openness, transparency, reciprocity, research integrity, and respect for intellectual property. When nations share these, like-minded nations share these values, then you hyper-partner. Then these allied partnerships combined with this other set of partnerships inside the nation, I can tell you, I see a future and I'm committed to this and I'm working hard in NSF and I'm sure others are doing the same, is we are going to make sure that we are not just going to be you know, competing, we are going to be in the vanguard of competitiveness for decades to come. So uh, I'm very confident people accuse me of being an optimist, but I am. And I know that this is not something that we cannot do. This nation has achieved such great things, is achieving great things and is poised to achieve even greater things in the future. 
Well, you have given us a lot to think about. Uh, this is all an ambitious, an ambitious set of uh, goals. And I know everyone on this uh, program is going to be watching closely to see how it develops. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you, Judy. Martinoff. It's such an honor to participate. Thank you. And I think now back to Mike. Pleasure to meet you all. Well, thank you both, Dr. Pantanaman, for your enthusiastic leadership. And Judy, as always, it's great to see you. And thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you.